We're going to start off with a presentation that will highlight some of the results we've generated from this work and its impact. And it will be presented by Malaria Consortium's uh, regional malaria, sorry, regional ME specialist, and that is Geoffrey Namara. So over to you, Geoffrey. Thanks, James. Um, we'll be back from lunch. I hope uh, you enjoyed it. This afternoon, I'm going to present uh, the results and the highlights um, from the project monitoring and evaluation of this uh, very project. Um, I did, I was very much involved in it, uh, leading the monitoring and evaluation component. We will share the results from the routine data that we've been collecting from the community health workers, uh, also include, including in that the methods that we're using for collection, the scale and for how long we collected this data, the result uh, and the results. In the evaluations, uh, we'll also share the evaluations that were conducted, at what time they were conducted and uh, the results from these evaluations. Diving straight into the routine data, first I'd like to share with you the processes that were involved uh, in, two, in getting this data. It all starts with the community health worker completing uh, the registers. Now, this varies from country to country. For example, from that level, uh, in S South Sudan and Uganda, there is an, a level of a community health worker supervisor to whom this data is sent first, whereas for the other countries, it straight away goes to the health facilities. That's for Mozambique and for Zambia. From there, because uh, in most of these countries, community health worker data is not yet incorporated into the mainstream health management information system, in three or four countries, it was now received by Malaria Consortium for entry and processing. As opposed, uh, in Mozambique, however, where it is already incorporated into the HMIS, it now goes into the district HMIS. We try very much to do feedback in all the countries, particularly in the quarterly review meetings. And in Mozambique, we get this data from the HMIS. So we extract it um, at district level or provincial level. That's how we're able to know the contribution of our community health workers. So that's a snapshot of how the data is moving from the lowest level all through to how we provide feedback. Going on to the scale and duration, particularly with the trainings, we've trained close to about 9,000 community health workers across the four countries, and majority of this has been in Uganda. Um, the targets have been met, the ones that we wanted to train, for example, in Uganda, two community health workers per village being trained in ICCM. So from about 3,400 villages, we got the targets. The attrition has been rather very good. It's all between 1% and 7%, which is quite impressive. And this is cumulative over time. So this emphasizes the fact that with a community health worker program entrenched within the main system, the attrition could actually be much better than you'd expect. We have had tons of data collected over this period. In Uganda, we've collected this data for over 30 months. And in Mozambique, which uh, Helen shared that started quite late, we've collected this uh, for only eight months through the HMIS, as I earlier said. Moving on to the reporting rates. For Mozambique, it's been good, above 70%. For South Sudan, it started off well, but as uh, you all know, the security situation worsened, so it started going down until when we couldn't collect this data anymore. That was early 2012. In Uganda, it's been very, very good. Remember here, we're dealing with about 7,500 community health workers reporting through the health facilities from where we pick it up. So having over 80%, especially in the later period, is we think that's fantastic for such a huge uh, number of community health workers. In Zambia, it's been fine. Um, around 
early 2012, it went down because this is at a point where we had a new phase of community health workers getting into the system. So as they were getting used to the reporting, it first went down, but by the end of the program, it was also beginning to get better. Uh, someone did ask about how does the diagnostic test relate to the positivity. Taking an example of uh, malaria, where we do RDTs for every fever, and we find that in Uganda, it's all the fevers have had an RDT done. This is from huge, huge, huge data. 7,000 VHTs reporting every month. Um, it could, it's a bit above 100, it's 111 percent, and one possible reason for that could be the repeat tests for every, for some fever cases. So a case is presenting with fever, an RDT is done, maybe the results are inconclusive, another RDT is done, that partially explains why you have more RDTs uh, being done for the fever. Positivity rates in Zambia, they're high, 80 percent of the RDTs that are done are positive, and in Uganda it's about 66%. Uh, percent. Moving on to pneumonia, uh, the respiratory rates that are measured, 91% in Uganda turn out positive, rather are high. In South Sudan, which uh, from the previous presentations, we see only 37% of those who've had a respiratory rate done is uh, reported as high. This is from routine data. And in Zambia, it's about 61%. There are implications for the, the South Sudan case, of course. Going on to the cases and treatments that have been provided by the community health workers, all still from the routine data that we are getting. <coughs> we have get provided treatments to about 1.7 million cases, providing two million treatments, and this, once again, is from uh, the data that we have received, from the routine reports that we've received. Majority of this has, of course, uh, been from Uganda, and most of the treatments have been ACTs and amoxicillin. There's been also zinc and uh, paracetamol uh, for the case of Zambia. Moving on to, if in a scenario if we had received all the reports. So adjusting for under-reporting, we're estimating that uh, we've provided about two point, close to three million treatments to about 2.4 uh, million cases. Looking at how the treatments relate, uh, moxicillin for pneumonia and SETs for malaria and ORS and zinc for diarrhea. We see that, for example, in Zambia, most of the treatments have been for malaria. Okay, and for the other countries, they relate quite well, but for, again, uh, Mozambique, we see more pneumonia than malaria. Overall, about 46% have been uh, malaria treatments and 38% pneumonia. Going into the variation between the results and the treatment, one of the questions we've had from the wider public was can community health workers be able to, uh, is there wastage or not? And we want to see how does that happen in this routine data. Uh, compare, looking at malaria, we would expect uh, that the SETs distributed should relate or should be equal to the positive RDTs that are being reported from this data. So if we have more SETs than the RDTs, it would be an indication that maybe there is over-treatment or if there were less SETs than RDTs, it would possibly indicate that there is under-treatment. Looking at the data, the RPABAB indicating uh, over-treatment and the lower side being under-treatment. For Uganda, this is how the picture looks. So over time, we see normalizing around no variations. Okay, for Zambia, it starts a bit under treatment, but also over time normalizes. And there could be other factors in play here, for example, stockouts, but bearing in mind that this is from a big, big number of VHTs or community health workers, some of those differences do uh, 
is out because of the huge data sets. So all of them over time, we see a tendency to normalize with no, no over or under treatment. And that's the same case for pneumonia, particularly for the case of Uganda. It's just above, around the line. So we can say that in Uganda, it's all, all uh, to the line. And for Zambia, we see these blips again. Around this time, remember, is when we had the new phase of community health workers. So a bit of changes. And maybe here, another possible reason could be the stockouts that do play a major role. Moving on to the evaluation. So that was the results from the routine data, a summary of the main things. Going on to the evaluations, we also did evaluations, and uh, these were in two approaches. We did the usual surveys that we all know about, but also tried to look at this impact by doing modeling, impact modeling. With the surveys, we did um, conduct baselines and endlines, that's pre-implementation of the program and post-implementation, at which the main outcome was child mortality, but there were several other outcomes uh, like morbidity and treatment-seeking behavior. Under modeling, we mainly were interested in uh, the impact using life-saved tool. I'll talk more about that. Going into the design and methods um, of the surveys that we did, we did a cross-sectional survey, and this was in all the countries at baseline and at endline. And at the end, we did uh, mortality surveys in three of the four countries. These were large-scale surveys of about 4,000 households in 100 clusters. But this was done at the end line because we, could, we can retrospectively measure mortality at baseline. So we weren't really into doing uh, the mortality surveys at baseline. And in the mortality surveys, we used the birth, birth history methodology, the direct method. Um, in these 100 clusters, we did a subsample of 40 clusters in which we now asked additional questions about the child health. And this was also done at uh, baseline and endline. These surveys followed the normal procedures of uh, standard surveys like the demographic and health surveys, the malaria indicator, indicator surveys, the multiple indicator cluster surveys, where we followed, we adapted the tools from them so we could compare the results and did all the entire process of collection, processing, analysis has been along the same lines for comparability purposes. Um, showing when we did these surveys, the blue bars do highlight the rainy seasons, estimated rainy seasons. So this is where the baselines were. In Mozambique, it was a little bit delayed, but all the others were about late 2009, early 2010, when the project was just, the implementation was just about to begin. Because we had uh, child, we wanted to do them mainly in the peak transmission se seasons. You see for these two, we tried as much as possible to put them right uh, in the middle of the rainy seasons. End lines were towards the end of the program implementation. That's late 2012, except in uh, South Sudan where that period would be a heavy rainy period and we could not access those areas. So we did it a little earlier and it was a joint survey with our colleagues from Save the Children and the International Rescue Committee. So overall, these were about two years apart, close to three years for some, Mozambique two years, but Uganda, which had the longest implementation, they were, these two surveys were three years apart. The results from the surveys. Uh, looking at reported fever, there were no changes between baseline and endline as expected. Uh, someone will discuss that a little more. And this was the same for reported acute respiratory infection. ARI was a proxy, we were, this was a proxy indicator with cough. We asked if you had cough and if this cough was, uh, you had fast short fast rapid breaths. So a combination of the two was used as a proxy uh, for acute respiratory infection. Reported diarrhea was also similar across uh, from baseline to endline. When we go on to the treatment seeking behavior, percentage of six children who sought treatment. So they went out 
and sought treatment. In Zambia, for all the three conditions, fever, acute respiratory infection, and diarrhea, it went up at end line. There was an increase, an improvement in seeking treatment for the children who are sick from about 70s to the 90s. So almost all the children saw treatment. In Uganda, it was similar. At end line, it was similar to baseline, except a slight increase in the area, which uh, wasn't that significant. In Mozambique, where we asked uh, slightly differently and asked irrespective of the condition they had if they sought treatment, it was also an increase. So across, we see an increase in uh, seeking treatment. Um, who did they, when we go into, again, treatment seeking behavior, but the first point of contact in seeking care. In Uganda, we see a particular trend in the community health workers who we are calling VHTs in Uganda. For all the three conditions, you see in Uganda, for example, at baseline, 1.9 prefer going to the community health workers, and this moved to 40% at end line. The same for acute respiratory infection, the same for diarrhea. And that's exactly the same we see for Zambia as well. Remember baseline for most of these countries, there were no community health workers, or very few community health workers. We see the same in Zambia from 16 to 68, 1.3% to 62%, 17 to 66%. So a shift to community health workers being the first point of contact in seeking care. Moving on to the proportion, the percentage that received appropriate treatment. And here appropriate, we are looking at uh, ACTs for fever, amoxicillin, or antibiotics for ARI, and zinc or ORS for diarrhea. A huge shift we see in Uganda at end line. They are receiving the appropriate care from about 10 to 30% to 60% for fever. The biggest increase we see it around fever and uh, diarrhea. For Zambia, it is also an improvement, a significant improvement from 50% to close to 80% for all the three conditions. For Mozambique, it's not changed much, and the confidence bands, of course, do overlap quite a lot. Here we had uh, slightly different sample sizes, which could uh, partly explain why that happened. The timing of treatment, so particular treatment within 24 hours of onset of either fever or ARI, we looked at those two. In Uganda, fantastic results, a huge shift seeking care within 24 hours of onset uh, of the illness. In Zambia, the same trend, significant improvements in timely seeking of treatment, timely taking treatment within 24 hours. And in Mozambique, some change, but not that significant. So those were brief results, uh, some of the results from the surveys. Now, going on to the impact modeling, where uh, we used LIST. LIST is a live save tool, and uh, this is just one of several modules that form up the spectrum model, that's an analysis and projections model that aids in uh, ascertaining the impact of whichever interventions that you've rolled out. It's a computer-based mo model, particular LIST, that focuses on child survival. There are other models that focus on reproductive health, family planning, but LIST in particular focuses on uh, child survival. It's, it's been developed by a collaboration of partners, uh, Futures Institute, the Child Health Epidemiology Reference Group, and, uh, that, and the International Child Development Steering Group. Um, so the way it works is with the intervention coverage data that you put in, it's able to project the changes in the child survival after a specified period of time. So for ICCM, how did we do uh, this? We did 
input the population data, what area we're covering. We did, and this was by age category, the anticipated population growth rate. We did also put in our baseline indicators to try and contextualize it to see what would be the effect of our treatment. Uh, so we used our own uh, population coverage indicators and what would expect in the non-intervention areas, so where we weren't uh, implementing ICCM. And from that, we were able to, the model was able to give us the changes in mortality, uh, mortality estimates during the implementation period and even after, and also the number of deaths that would be averted over that period of time. So showing results from uh, the model, the modeling, in Uganda in particular, um, where in 2009 the under five mortality rate was 100 deaths per thousand live births in our implementation period, putting in the coverage indicators that I just showed to you earlier, in 2012 at the end of the implementation period, we were anticipating uh, a mortality rate of about 86 deaths per thousand live births. If we project that further to 2015, it is expected to be about 72 deaths uh, per thousand live births in the under five population. We are estimating about 439 deaths having been averted because of the intervention, and this is about 4% of all the deaths that would have occurred. If we project that to 2015, we're estimating 7% of the deaths to have been uh, averted. Similar case for Zambia, we see a reduction in mortality from 102 deaths per thousand live births to about 81 deaths per thousand live births in the intervention period, in the inter implementation areas. And this could go to, to just 72 uh, deaths per thousand live births if you project that to 2015, saving about 12% of the deaths that would have otherwise occurred. For Mozambique, a similar case, saving about 9% of the deaths that would have uh, occurred. So, the lessons that we're able to learn from these results are that one, it is feasible for these community health workers, who we call the non-medical community-based agents to deliver these life-saving medicines according to the set national policies and guidelines. We've seen that uh, seeking behavior goes up significantly. They become the first choice of uh, seeking care. We've also learned that the community-based agents can provide a complementary and acceptable source of effective treatment. Uh, from the survey results, we have also learned that access to timely treatments uh, of sick children has increased with the introduction of ICCM. We saw uh, those bars significantly going up at end line. And uh, from the LIST model, these projections illustrate a potential for mortality reduction with sustained ICCM. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we believe that ICCM is a feasible approach for increasing access to effective treatment for childhood illnesses. Therefore, urgent scale-up is needed to enable most of these countries to achieve their MDG4. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Geoffrey. Um, any Questions from the chat room? Okay, then maybe Darren. Thanks. Um, that conclusion that you showed there, um, have you used that or do you plan to use that in advocating with governments to increase their investment in human resources for health? Uh, we definitely intend to use that. We've seen results uh, backed up by evidence and we think that uh, these would, this data would help us uh, advocate for more funding for ICCM. Has anything been done yet, or is this to come? 
Um, um, Eleni, do you want to say something, or Helen? <laughs> advocacy efforts both internationally and nationally in the countries where we're implementing or beginning to implement such as Nigeria so there is continuous advocacy work going on at sub-national level supporting districts to start planning and budgeting for ICCM supporting governments to take on these costs and working with other implementing partners and donors to, to try and get in increased support or maintain support and at I think, all levels. And I think Darren just to, to emphasize that a lot of this information is hot off the press. So um, we shall be taking forward the information into our advocacy as well as the comments that come from this discussion. Teresa, then uh, Anne-Marie. Uh, it's a great presentation. Um, I just want to talk a bit about like, the Live Save tool and us standardizing how we do things across these different projects. Um, first of all, when you project it out to 2015, how are you doing that projection? Were you taking the coverage from 2012 and assuming that it was being sustained to 2015 or increasing that? The second is, did you look to, at, um, to try to attribute what proportion of the deaths of bird it were due to the um, ICCM? Because there's a way to also uh, do that um, um, as, as well. And I think that we kind of have to do things similarly across the different countries. Finally, did you, did you say that you actually collected at the end mortality data as well? Because what we would have been doing, well, what, what I've been doing is taking the end line survey, uh, calculating the mortality rate, and using that as the baseline mortality rate in list. Um, because that's kind of when you, you know, when you do direct birth histories, when you collect it, uh, at a certain point in time, it really reflects the mortality it was two or three years earlier. Thanks very much, Teresa, for the good questions. Uh, yes, we did. I'll begin with your second question. We did collect mortality data at Endline, as I earlier said, uh, through the birth history methodology. Analysis for that is underway, so we should be able to get that uh, pretty soon. On uh, the list question, uh, I'll ask Karin, my colleague, who we've heavily who's heavily done this, to probably respond to that question. Thanks, Teresa. I, I just, I think, very good points there. Uh, what we show is a very conservative estimate of the number of deaths averted because we accounted for, um, in the non, what we took as the non-ICCM implementing areas, we're not assuming a constant coverage in those areas. We're actually looking at a, a slow improvement in those areas as well, um, looking at both past trends and in increased coverage, and also looking at the default coverage rate that comes with the program. So there's already default rates of coverage for Uganda at a national level, and assuming that even though they were lower in our, when we did our surveys, we're assuming that they will increase it to at least what is default in the, the default rates in the tool. So we actually compare it against a scenario whereby mortality is already decreasing. Um, and when we project forward, we're looking at the current, the rate that we saw in improvement um, from baseline to end line and just projecting that same trend into the future, but assuming that it can't go beyond 90% coverage, that that's kind of saturation. So those are the assumptions we did. And I agree with you that one of the things we're going to, to do, which we've been discussing a lot is to compare now the list results with the actual um, birth history results and you see if there's actually any similarity in the rates that we get from the two methods. We know there's a lot of limitations with this model as well. Okay. Anne-Marie? Hi, thank you. Um, great presentation and, and great data sets as well. Um, I just had a, a question about the um, RDT positivity rate in Zambia. That seems surprisingly high for Zambia generally. Was that something that you were surprised by and is there any way to dig down on that a little bit more as to, as to what the reason for that was? Uh, thanks. Yes, we were equally surprised. The, the RDT positivity in Zambia was quite high. But uh, from the data sets that we, that the data sets that we have, these are really huge data sets of about uh, close to 1,000 community health workers reporting every month over a two and a half year period. 
we wouldn't think that there are several factors that have caused that that are by, uh, introducing an error in that result so yes we we would would definitely look into it a little more but the uh, the result should be just about that because of the huge data sets that we have and i think just to emphasize that lopolo province seems to have the highest prevalence of malaria in zambia so i think it's a misconception that malaria is low in zambia i think in terms of malaria transmission the higher you go up to the north i think the more the burden so i think to some extent it's not it's the level rather than the intensity of transmission that's surprising shay then um prudence and then teresa will have your presentation next Thank you, Jeffrey. That was really, really useful to see those results. I have two very quick questions. One, you look, when you looked at appropriate treatment, as you know, the InScale project, we're also interested in appropriate treatment, which is our outcome. Um, I, in kind of looking at the change in appropriate treatment over your, between your end line and your baseline, I, I just kind of missed what your actual appropriate treatment levels were and the differences between diarrhea, malaria, and pneumonia. It would be good to see those. I don't know if you could show those. Uh, sorry, I don't think I quite got your question. I would like to know the percentage level of appropriate treatment for those three diseases. Okay. Okay, um, so that was slide, question one. Yeah. Question two was just a, a follow-on question, I think, from Teresa on the Live Save tool, which I, I think that's a, a very ingenious way to, to look at your, your life saved in this particular scenario. However, um, I just wanted to find out how, how did you... What did you assume, how many lives did you assume that ICCM would save before you actually projected that when you were doing your coverage and changing your coverage figures, if that makes sense? You must have had an effect size, right? You must have had, we thought it was going to reduce 20% of lives, 20% um, of deaths due to each of those three diseases and therefore, and because it's a projection, I think it might be useful to actually do like a sensitivity analysis and look at lots and lots of different possible reduction sizes and not just look at ICCM alone, look at it in terms of also other projects or, um, or public health initiatives that may be implemented at the same time because that mm -hmm. will impact on your actual number of lives deaths averted and um, it could give possibly misleading figures if you're just looking at ICCM in isolation and trying to promote that as a strategy that will save this amount of lives. Okay. True. Um, Thanks. Thanks, Ray. Those are noted. I think as you show the slide with the treatment, um, appropriate treatment, maybe Karen, you want to say something about the list? And then maybe just to, to really clarify that throughout our presentation, we're not advocating for one solution to addressing the problem of childhood illnesses. We appreciate the multiplicity of these interventions and I think it's something we're going to be discussing more in the sustainability aspect. So at no point are we saying ICCM is the only way to go. Karen. Um, yeah, thanks, Shay, for that question because it actually reminded me of the bit of the Teresa's question I didn't answer. This was not ICCM effect. Uh, this was the effect of increasing coverage to these interventions, regardless of where the children receive treatment from. So it's assuming that the access to antimalarials, for example, appropriate treatment with antimalarials was increased from 59%, was, what was it, 9 in Uganda, to uh, 58% regardless of where the treatment was coming from. However, first of all, we know there wasn't that much other activities happening in these areas at the same time. ICCM was really the only uh, program that would have increased coverage. Um, the other factor, why it might seem um, low, I mean, we know um, coverage doesn't, this, this increase doesn't happen overnight. This is a coverage that has, happened over a year and a half, two years. So the actual impact of ICCM is only, that's why the, the number of deaths averted really only become big numbers after a few years because the first couple of years where coverage is kind of slowly cover, coming up is where um, the number of the numbers seemed quite small. So, um, but to then come back to Teresa's point, I think, yes, we can look at the impact of that ICCM had as a component of that. Uh, but we haven't done that analysis yet, but it's something we can do. 
Okay, then Prudence, and then there's a question coming from the, the, the chat room. Thank you, Jeffrey. That was very interesting. Um, there were some questions which have already partially been answered, but I wondered if you could, if, if in your positivity rates over time, you've noticed a decrease in positivity rates of, of the RDTs, and whether you can measure that, and whether that could be accounted for by bed net distributions or bed net utilization. And presumably, we asked that in the survey. Uh, uh, both baseline and endline, and if there was any increase in other interventions, for example. So that was one question. The second question was about diarrhea. In the UNICEF, morbidity and mortality related to diarrhea is one of the highest, even more so than, uh, than pneumonia and malaria. And, and yet your people seeking treatment for diarrhea seem to be actually very low. And maybe we need to concentrate more on getting people to come for diarrhea treatment. So, so that was, I, I just wondered if you had any comment about that. And the other thing was, in Uganda, that the, the, the utilization of the community health worker only went up to less than 40%. So I wondered where people were going. You know, as the community health worker is very available, why weren't people actually using them more than they were? Can I answer that? Uh, thanks very much, uh, Prudence, for this questions. Beginning with your last one of uh, community health workers uptake in Uganda, we know that of all the three count countries or four countries, Uganda has the biggest private sector. So there's a tendency to go to the, the there's loads of clinics and uh, drug shops. So that could partially explain why the shift for community health workers in Uganda isn't as big as for the other um, countries. Uh, Positivity rates, yes, for all this data, we've done other analysis that looks at now trends because we've collected it over a long period of time. Uh, I can later share with you the trends for RDT positivity for all the countries that I did uh, present. We have this data. Um, documenting other factors like net distribution and things like that, we've had uh, dedicated efforts to make sure we document what was happening in these areas that we're implementing in. So we will, in additional analysis, be looking at what was happening, perhaps to look for plausible reasons why this, these trends are happening. Okay. Um. Oh, yes, you had the additional question of the area. It's, um, can I ask one of my colleagues to respond to that? I, Helen, I think, I'm looking at Helen. No, I think, I think Prudence is, the challenge is the data speaks. And that's the data we have. Why people are not uh, either bringing their children with diarrhea, do they consider it not a very serious problem or, or, or they go somewhere else or they, uh, they want antibiotics for diarrhea which you know we're not providing? I mean, it, it, did we explore any of the reasons why the uptake of diarrhea care was not very high? No, I think, I think that's, that's, that's the sort of thing that we now have to go into and to look at. Um, and I think that's why some of the qualitative results that we're getting will also help to inform that. And it illustrates a very important point in working towards sustainability is that you start off with models, you refine your models, you find out what's going right, what's going wrong, and you adjust to come up with something that actually fits the public health context. Um, I wanted, yes, there's a question, Geoffrey, which was asked earlier about workload. Yes, uh, thanks for reminding me, James. Yes, we've, we've done uh, that analysis of uh, the workload for community health workers over time. Uh, what I can share briefly is the averages. Mozambique has the highest because the community health workers or the average there are seeing even the adults, not just the children. And the monthly workload for Mozambique is about 85 children and adults combined. For Uganda, it is 12. So per month. Per month. These are all figures per month. Uh, for South Sudan, it's about nine. And for Zambia, it's about 25. So Zambia has a very high load of com uh, the children seen per community health worker per month. OK, from the chat room, any other question? Um, there's a question from Jorgen Stajin in MSF saying, 
it seems that access to health care at community level has increased substantially and health seeking behavior has changed. Any idea what the impact was on the disease burden at the health center level? Was there any decrease? That's a very good question. Yes, we did also go, we took the interest in uh, seeing what's happening at the health facilities and uh, collected the HMIS data from about 2008 before, way before implementation all through to 2012. For several countries, you see OPD attendance for malaria cases going down. That's what I can say, the data says. Okay, thank you very much, Geoffrey. Moving on to Teresa. And then, um, yep, yeah, we'll have a, a break.